next category of interest rate is called the risk-free rate. And I know we talked about this when uh, in, in the first category uh, for treasury rates or T-bills. Uh, but uh, we'll make specific reference just to risk-free rate without, without saying what that benchmark is, but that the risk-free rate is a conclusion of a relationship. Let's just say that. Well, what's the relationship? <clears throat> well, if we set up a riskless portfolio, and a riskless portfolio, uh, as we'll see throughout this whole, whole uh, uh, course that we go through, is where we have an asset and we will sell or buy a derivative to offset the price of that asset such that we can lock in a gain, a riskless gain, and simply just wait for the option to expire and either deliver or take delivery of the asset. So all we are doing is allowing time to pass. Once we set up the riskless portfolio, the profit is locked in, but it's realized at a particular future time period once the derivative expires. So the return on the riskless portfolio is the risk-free rate. So rather than saying the T-bill is the risk-free rate, or that over here is the risk-free rate, or something else is the risk-free rate, even governments have risk. Although we call it risk-free, it's not risk-free in general. It's default risk-free. That's all it is. So over the course of time, what we're saying is that the relationship between these assets over time will return the risk-free rate. So a riskless portfolio will be arbitraged away to the point where the only return on it is the risk-free rate. And it is the and whatever risk-free rate we're choosing, however we price the derivative, we will choose some reference rate for this risk-free rate, and we will build a riskless portfolio. And in doing so, we will price the derivative such that over time it returns that benchmark rate. And I know that sounds sort of cyclical that we're going to start at the end and work our way backwards, but that's really it. We say, well, what's the value of this derivative? Well, let's assume we set up a riskless portfolio and let's assume that it takes six months uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, that we're looking at a six month time period. What reference rate we use for the risk-free rate depends on the context. And the reference rate chosen will affect the derivatives price. If you have three or four different rates and they're all slightly different, the derivatives price will be slightly different in each case as well. So there we go. There's a, a bunch of rates. Let's look at measurement because measurement is important. I said the, the new thing we're going to introduce here is continuous compounding. So let's work our way towards continuous compounding so you can see where we're going here. So let's take a, a, a standard statement, $100 at 10%. Well, what does that mean, $100 at 10%? It means if it's annual, compounding, we're looking at $110. That's what it means. If we're talking about semi-annual compounding, $100 at 10% is $110.25. If we're talking quarterly, it's $110.38. We're talking monthly, $110.47. As you can see, the value of our, the future value of our $100 at 10% is increasing if, as the number of compounding periods increases. Well, the most, the limit if we, if we look at the difference between these two, we have a difference of 0.25. If we look at the difference between these two, we have a difference of 0.13. Here again, the difference is 0.11. Here, our delta, our, I, don't, I don't want to use the word delta. I'm just going to say difference. You get to, that it's just a Greek letter, delta, but I don't want to use it in the term that we're going to see delta later on. The difference here is 0 0.04, and the difference between these two is 0 0.01. So we can see that this is a, a decreasing series. It's a limit. So as the interest rate divided by the number of compounding periods, as this ratio approaches zero, because let's say our interest rate is 10%, as M gets larger and larger, uh, as annual, that's 1, semi-annual is 2, quarterly is 4, monthly is 12, weekly is 52, daily is 365. This ratio will get smaller and smaller. As it approaches 0, this relationship, 1 plus r over m to the n, approaches e to the rn. So, as we get as m, which is our compounding periods per year, as m gets larger and larger, we can go from daily to uh, hourly 
to minute to second. However, the difference between uh, uh, each successive increase will get smaller and smaller. It will limit. And in the limit, it limits to e to the power rn. This is called continuous compounding. And if you've taken a fixed income course, you probably, probably have not seen this. This is, uh, however, derivatives will price themselves using continuous compounding more so than, uh, uh, than, than fixed income will. And there is a reason for this. And when we look at uh, uh, pricing futures or pricing options, uh, it'll become clear as to why we would use a continuous compounding instead of any other type of compounding. In fact, you could probably get away with daily compounding uh, when you price derivatives. You could probably get away with it, but here's the deal. Uh, it's extra work. It's just extra math and extra arithmetic to always use a daily rate and keep adjusting for the daily rate. It's easier, easier mathematically to use the notation because in the limit, that's what it is. It's continuous compounding. So if we are moving forward in time, that means if we're taking $100 and figuring out with continuous compounding, what is it going to be worth in the future? Uh, whatever value it is, let's say that we have A dollars, it would be A times E to the Rn, where R is your interest rate, N is the number uh, of periods of which you're compounding for. So three months, N would be 0.25. Six months, N would be 0.5. Five years, N would be five. And R, of course, is your interest rate. If you're moving backwards in time, which means you have some future amount and you're discounting it to a present value, uh, whatever the dollar amount, let's say you have $8, you're moving backwards in time, it's simply just E to the negative Rn. So it's, it's nice to work with. It's easier to work with than it is to take an interest rate and divide it by M all the time because you'd get 365. And if you know much about programming and calculators, when you start dividing a percentage, like let's say 2% by 365 and then multiplying it by something, your floating rate, it's a, a floating rate pointer, or a floating rate point that, that determines the, the number inside the calculator, you start losing decimal places. So it's much easier to work with the, exponent, with the exponent, exponential function than it is to work with n over m. And in the limit, that's what it comes to anyways. So get used to using continuous compounding and continuous discounting as opposed to um, annual, semi-annual, quarterly, monthly. We won't worry about that. Well, if we're going to use continuous compounding, we're going to have to find a way to convert from non-continuous compounding, M, to continuous compounding and back again. So here's uh, what we'll start with, uh, just to follow along with the yellow formula here. e to the r, and I've got the sub c for continuous compounding. This is our dollar amount, whatever a is, uh, a dollars, uh, continuously compounded into the future. Whatever the rate is for rc should be equal to uh, whatever compounding period m happens to be. So if it's semi-annual or quarterly, we can find a rate for our m that is that will produce the same result as the rate continuously compounded so this is what we want to do so if we're given a rate let's say we're given our m we know what our m is and we say well we know what our m is but that's not good enough for pricing the derivative we we want to know what our c is what is the equivalent outcome if it were compounded continuously so since these two amounts must equal, we have to find an RC and an RM that equates these two together. The first thing we can do, uh, and the book has just the book is, gives you this, and then sort of just gives you the final the final uh, um, equations. But I like it when everybody can derive the equations right from the beginning, so they don't have to memorize. They can just they can just follow it through on their own. So if this is the uh, equality that we have to preserve, let's divide both sides by A because A is common on both sides and let's just get rid of it and this is what we'll get uh, in, in the end. Well, we have an N term in, uh, in the numerator that's common to both sides so we can get rid of that and this is what we're left with. Uh, if we take the natural log of both sides, the E to the RC just becomes RC. The power comes down, the E disappears. And the power comes out in front, m, and then the internal, uh, the, the bracket is 
uh, ln 1 plus rm over m. Well, we got to get rid of this m, so let's divide both sides by m. If we divide both sides by m, we have rc over m equals the natural log of what we have here. And this is messy to work with, so let's simplify this. We can say that this is y, and this is x. So what we have is y equals the natural log of x, y equals ln x. So since ln x equals y, we just have to fill in x equals e to the y. x equals e to the y. Now if you take the natural log of both sides, what will you get? You will get this. And what is this? This is this. And what is this? This is this. So now all we have to do is just substitute back in for x. So x was 1 plus r m over m equals e. And what was our y? y was r c over m. Now we can subtract 1 from both sides. So we'll get r m over m equals e r c over m minus 1. And multiply both sides by m to get rid of the, uh, the numerator here. We'll end up with r m equals to m e r c minus 1. And look what we have. So if we know our continuous compounding rate, rc, we can always find out what rm is for any period of m. So if we know rc, uh, we know our rm. And if we know rm, Look what we can do over here. We can go back to our formula over here. If we know Rm, then Rc equals m, 1 plus Rm over m. And there is our second. So with these two functions, and these are the results in the book, the book just says these two things have to equal, and then it runs right to these. You should be able to work your way through the math. This is, this is grade 12 math. It really is. It's, it's, this, is, this isn't difficult, but if you're not used to working with, uh, uh, with natural logs and the exponential function, it may, uh, you may need a little bit of a reminder of how to actually derive uh, the results, but you should know how to derive the results. So if we're given a problem where we don't know what the continuous compounding rate is, but we know what the periodic rate is, Rm, we, we can find Rc because rc is listed here as a function of rm. If we know rc, we can find rm because it's listed as a function of rc. So we can move from a periodic compounding rate to a continuous compounding rate. We can move from a continuous compounding rate back to a periodic compounding rate. I know it's a lot of, uh, a lot of time I've taken on just this one little thing, and it just takes up four or five lines in the book, but really, uh, uh, the true understanding, the ability to manipulate uh, uh, um, later on, comes from a firm, solid foundation of the basics. When you learn how to play piano, you play those scales over and over and over and over, because in doing it, uh, you be the, 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 the notes become so common to you that you can begin to see them in your head, and then you can start to compose and engineer something new on top of that. But if you don't have this solid foundation, if you can't see the relationships of how things work, uh, it, it, the, the, you can only go so far. So the more time you spend on these little things, uh, the more insight you get later on because you get all the relationships. You can see it in your mind. You don't need to draw it out on paper. The architecture of, of, of that financial engineering will be in your head and you'll be able to see it. Okay. Well, let's try some examples. Uh, the, uh, it, it's hard to learn how to swim by just reading a book about it. You actually have to get in the water, so let's get wet here. Example number one, let's say that we have a 10% per annum uh, uh, interest rate uh, with uh, two compounding periods per year. So 10% uh, with two con compounding periods per year, we know that's 1.05 squared for the year. It's, it's the equivalent rate of it. But we want to know what a continuous compounding rate is, so we're really looking for what RC is. Well, we've already uh, uh, learned that RC is this formula here, 1 plus Rm over M. 
So all we have to do is uh, we know our m is 2, and we know our, our m is uh, the, the compounding uh, rate is 10%. Uh, so it equals 2 natural log of 1 plus 0 .0, uh, sorry, 0 0.10 over 2, which is 2 natural log of 1.05. And all we have to do is solve for that. And what I did over here, if you're uh, figure, trying to figure out how to do it on the calculator, it's fairly straightforward. You just enter in 1.05, then you hit the uh, natural log key. Then you multiply it by 2 equals 0 0.0978, so 9.78%. So 10% uh, with two compounding periods a year is equivalent to a continuously compounded rate of 9.78%. So if we continuously compound a sum at 9.78% for a year, let's say A for one year, it will equal uh, the same A compounded at 10% semi-annually. They'll equal the same thing. So now we found the equivalent rates. Well, let's work backwards. Let's say that we know what the continuous compounding rate is. It's 8%. 8% uh, uh, some, some sum of money compounded continuously at 8% will grow to something. Well, what rate would be required if it were only compounded quarterly? Uh, well, here we know our M is 4, and our continuous compounding rate is 0 0.08. And now we're looking to find our M. And RM, we've already calculated, is e M E to the R C over M minus 1. So we just substitute in. Our M is 4. E, R C is 0 0.08 divided by 4 is 0 0.02 minus 1. And so we just have to solve for that. So how do we do it? We type in 0 0.02, hit your second function, and the, nat and the uh, um, natural log key, because on top of the natural log key, your second function is E e to the x. Uh, so 0 0.02 second function e to the x uh, minus 1 because that's what we have here minus 1 times 4 will equal 8.08 .08. so you'll get 8.08 percent. So what does it mean? You have to be able to say in words what this means. This means if we take some sum of money A and we continuously compound it for one year, it will be the same as taking that sum of money and compounding it by 8.08% uh, 8 .08 quarterly. So 8.08% 8 .08 quarterly will grow to the same amount of money as 8% compounded continuously. So you have to be able to, to say in words what these things mean because if you're just saying RC equals RM times A, well, that's kind of difficult. Math just helps us communicate easily and precisely. You still have to be able to say in words exactly what we have here. So once you do something mathematically and you get a conclusion, say it in words to yourself. If you can't say it in words, you don't understand it yet. So as, as long as you can say it in words. So let's do it one more time here just so that you get it and we'll do it with the first example. What does 9.78% mean? It means if we take some sum of money A and we compound it continuously at... 9.78%. It would be the same outcome as taking some sum of money and compounding it at 5% at squared, at 10% compounded semi-annually. So these two would be the same. So 9.78% compounded continuously is the same as 10% compounded semi-annually. I know I'm taking some trouble with that, but Students are very good at getting to this 9.78, and you say, well, what does that mean now? And then they lose it. You have to, that's not the end of the question. This is what a computer can do. We don't need you. If this is all you can do, we don't need you. You have to take it one step further. Okay, let's move on.